This episode of Rookie Hunter is brought to you by the Wild Sheep Foundation. Adventures in sheep country can change your life. And as residents of BC, we're very fortunate to have three different species of sheep in our province. After attending the Wild Sheep Foundation's annual convention, Sheep Show, in Reno, Nevada, we got to see what conservation looks like firsthand. The Wild Sheep Foundation's ability to raise and put millions of dollars on the ground each year to keep these majestic animals on the mountaintops worldwide is unmatched. The Wild Sheep Family is a diverse group of people from all walks of life, and membership is open to anyone. Whether you're a seasoned pro, it's your first time on the mountain, or you just like to see sheep on the hillside, you can sign up and join today. Kelly and I are lifetime members, but you can become an annual member for just $45. You can also become a member of the Less Than One Club, which is the only club you want to get kicked out of. If you've never taken a North American or international ram, you can join us in the Less Than One Club for an extra $25. Plus, Less Than One Club membership also includes entry into a draw for three separate doll sheep hunts, which will be given away at Sheep Show in 2019. For more information on the Wild Sheep Foundation and to become a member, head over to thewildsheepfoundation.org. Hey guys, Scouts, welcome to episode 84 of Rookie Hunter. Today on the show, we're going to answer some questions from Instagram and uh, go over some stuff that's happening here in British Columbia. But don't worry, it's relevant to wherever you are listening from. Please support our sponsors, Wild Sheep Foundation. We're only a few months away here from uh, Sheep Show in uh, Reno, Nevada. We hope to see some of you guys there. If you want to register, you can head over to the wildsheepfoundation.org. And you best be booking your hotel. There's promo codes for the hotels. And uh, you want to get your flights, all that stuff lined up before things get too expensive or booked up. Again, that's wildsheepfoundation.org. Also, head over to northarmknives.com. Get something for somebody on your list before the holidays roll around. Maybe just get something for yourself. Again, that's northarmknives.com. For everything Rookie Hunter related, please check out the website, which is the rookiehunter.com. And yeah, you guessed it. We want some ratings and reviews. So please head over to iTunes. You can throw some stars up there or you can actually leave a comment and let us know what you think of the show. We read all that stuff and we're always trying to make the show better. So your input does count. You can send us an email with uh, thoughts, suggestions, show ideas, info at therookiehunter.com. Let's get into this episode. We've only got a few more left before the year's over. Sit back, relax, crack a cold beer and enjoy episode 84 of Rookie Hunter. A selfie stick though <laughs> just go to buck or two i'm not doing it anyways yeah you'd see know. the video of the irishman trying to eat the pizza <laughs> no but he's super drunk or oh, he's trying to carry it and he ultimately ends up uh dropping it on the ground but it's pretty good nice <clears throat> kelly what's going on how you doing good i got oscar here beside me it seems like he's down for the count. Yeah, he's Friday, I guess. Friday. We got a, a second dog. It's my uh, nephew dog, I guess. Yeah, Cash. for the day or for the weekend. Oh, I got him for 10 days. Oh. Yeah, he's uh, farting. That's his specialty. <laughs> yeah, man, he devoured that food. <laughs> he's a, a big dog. Yeah, Rhodesian Ridgeback is 100 and something. Pounds, yeah. he's a he's a big beast. Not like a fat, no, he's but just a, like a big, yeah, version of a ridgeback. Big brute. Um, what's new, man? It hasn't been that long. Yeah, I know. Just I'm happy it's Friday. Mm-hmm. I'm happy I have this. Uh, what do we have here? Yeah, what's on tap? It's a field house. Um, passion fruit, something or other. There's a description on the side of that. Actually, this is Field House Brewing Pinot Noir Brute IPA. Small batch, um, 7.9%. Holy shit. Uh, A blend of wine and beer styles. This IPA is fermented extremely dry and features a pairing of Pinot Noir grape juice and mosaic hops, which complement each other's berry, herbal, and floral aromas. By dry hopping with mosaic, citra, and Simcoe, we further push the hop complexity and brightness. It's pretty good. 
Yeah, man. Like I think Fieldhouse is edging into my top brewery spot. Yeah, I'd say so. Because I think their collaborations and and creativity with this stuff is just off the charts. Yeah, yeah definitely. Tasty. I, I like the old school. I don't know what you would call this, but it's almost like a a jarring type, a jar look. Yeah, it's good stuff, man. What do you want to start with? You want to do some questions? Uh, yeah, let's do that. Okay. We got a couple questions from Derek. Is there any animal that got away that keeps you up at night? And uh, I started to think about this. Initially, I thought no. And then a couple of things <laughs> came to mind. When when we first, the first season that we started hunting, I, I had just gotten to the, the, the spot that I wanted to, to go to. And just hopped out of the truck and I was getting myself sorted out, get my rifle out, get my pack ready. Had the, I think I had Oscar with me. And uh, I looked up on the top of this ridge and it was probably like 250 yards up. Mm-hmm. And there was a big whitetail standing right on the ridge. So all I could see was the outline of this this whitetail buck. And because I was so new to hunting, nerves got the best of me in that situation. And I was worried that it was a mule deer because I think at that point it would have it wouldn't have been like uh, any buck. It would have been four point. Hmm. So I was worried number one that it wasn't a four point. Number two that it wasn't a white tail. It was definitely a white tail. And then the other thing was it was it was right up on top of the the ridge with nothing behind it. So if I had taken a shot at it and if I had missed or whatever, if the bullet had gone through it, it would have been shooting into no man's land, right? Which you don't want to do, but I was so nervous and unsure of the situation and my hands are shaking like, fuck, I don't know if I should take the shot or not. And this buck just stood there for like so long and gave me every opportunity to take a shot at it, but I never did just because I wasn't ready at that point. Yeah. Just so unsure of the whole situation though. Yeah, for sure. So it doesn't keep me up at night, but I do think about that buck and it would have been like, as a first deer and everything, it would have been pretty rad. But, you know, the more I think about it, the more I realize that um, I, w- I wasn't ready for it. Right. How about you, Kelly? Is there any... Uh, <laughs> do like that three keep- popped into my head right <laughs> off the bat. And I'm sure those aren't the only ones. <laughs> the first one that pops into my head is the, the deer that I wounded the first season we started hunting. Yeah. Which you can check out in one of the earlier episodes. Like yeah, I'm thinking first five first episodes. First five for sure, yeah. Where we, I had taken a shot that was kind of like a really steep downhill shot at a whitetail buck. And um, I thought I missed, but then we found a little bit of a blood trail. And uh, I think what happened was I, I clipped his front leg a little bit and we lost the trail and actually saw him like running over trees. Uh, and this is after like four, five, I don't know how many hours of, Fuck, I, don't I, know. I literally couldn't, I could hardly walk out of there because the snow was so deep. And there was so much lifting of your leg to take a step that my whole, like both groins were just like, I felt like both of them were pulled. Yeah. Um, that was after hours without snowshoes. And I think we put in a solid effort, but that one still keeps me up at night because I never want to be in that situation again. No. Man, it was, we almost had like a Renella moment there. Because remember we went down to check, we gave it some time and then we went down to check it out. And out of nowhere, this deer just runs it didn't try to charge us no but it was trying to evade us but it rode it ran right beside you and just plowed into all these short trees right yeah. so like young growth yeah. trees and all you heard was just like just china a bull in a china shop yeah because it was going through those so all you could see was trees like slapping back and forth and all the snow that was falling off of them and, yeah yeah it was it the crazy out of us and, because he was running, we couldn't get another shot off yeah. on him either. But uh, I've got yeah. a, I have a couple more. Okay. <laughs> one of them is uh, when we stumbled upon that uh, bachelor group. Oh. One of them had huge antlers, but it was just a three point. I was thinking about that deer yesterday. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but there were, there was one four point and we had two chances and both times I didn't have a spotter then. And I had my binos on it and it was just, they were so grouped together and moving together that I couldn't actually give you the correct signals yeah. to take the right shot. And we weren't comfortable enough yeah. to, they just kept shifting. And there's one more. Although I did get a four, four point that year in that same spot. So we might've got them. Yeah. You might've got the same, yeah. the same deer. The other one was the uh, white tail I called in when I was in 
the land in the yeah, land right. in, in our spot there. And um, that one, that one's probably the one that I think of the most in terms of the deer that got away because I hadn't got a deer yet. I was out there, I put in a whole day whitetail hunting, sitting in one spot. And then this deer pops out when I least expect it. I look over, didn't have my gun and there's a deer like 30 yards away and it's staring right at me. And as soon as I moved my head, it just took off. It's gone, yeah. So I w- you always have to be ready. And that was like a three or four point whitetail buck. Just literally felt like I could touch him almost. It was crazy. Yeah. That's the one that really bothers me as far as. <laughs> Especially with whitetail because it's like. Yeah. We, but that'll probably never happen again. Yeah, man. <laughs> without a tree stand. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, in terms of animals that got away, I think that's the the big one for me. Caden is this next one we got here. What made you guys choose a general season stone sheep hunt over a general season bighorn hunt for next year? Or have you considered it? For me, I think there's something special about stone sheep because BC is the only place that has them. Yeah. Arguably, there's some in uh, NWT, I think. But we're kind of responsible for that species. And I kind of think it's like the the top of the, it's like the pinnacle and also just the remoteness of it and, and the Northern BC aspect and the yeah. fly-in aspect. And I don't know, I would love to do both really, but I kind of, the one thing that worries me about the bighorn side of things is just the um, amount of locals around. And I think that a lot of the locals watch those rams all year. So it turns into a little bit of a, rat race is what i've heard yeah which we won't avoid that and i'm sure there's ways to do it i just don't know much about that side yeah of things i would agree cash you'd be quiet next question okay major mclean says when scouting for a day do you guys bring water uh water perf- jesus fucking christ i just tried that again <laughs> <laughs> So when scouting for a, a day, do you guys bring a water purification method like an MSR pump or do you guys just keep extra water in your backpack? I always throw my water filter in my pack. It's not that heavy, especially if you're going out for a day of scouting. It's like your pack is pretty light <clears throat> anyways at that point. And it depends where I'm going to. There's like, I don't worry too much about drinking from streams and there's some places that I'll just gladly drink right out of it without filtering it it's probably better off to to actually filter it but um for the most part i always just throw it in my pack just from a safety perspective so if something happens and uh, you get lost or you're stuck out there and you need to filter water from a questionable source then you're taken care of mm-hmm. i used to bring i have that um <clears throat> i still have it is a life straw which is a pretty basic method you just you know put your face down in a puddle or or a stream and you can suck right through the straw and it filters the water for you. So not a bad idea to carry that stuff if you're hiking or scouting or, or hunting just just in case something happens. Yeah, I always bring one of the uh, smaller Sawyer type push gravity feed type uh, yeah. things. And I mean, that's that's literally no weight. Just throw it in there just in case. Yeah, it doesn't hurt. So I yeah. would say bring it along with you. Why not? Yeah, and the one I have is the Catadine Be Free, one liter. Did you ever f- find the oh, Sawyer Mini? Is that I never. It was? I don't. I didn't find mine. Hmm. No. I wonder where um, that ended up. I actually don't mind the Catadine. It's the same concept, but it's actually like its own water bottle. Nice. So, yeah, I I, I like it. Cool. Yeah, I've got the Catadine Hiker Pro. We've talked about that one a lot. It's bigger, but it's great for. For multiple people, it's fast, and uh, I don't mind packing that thing around. I love it. It's been I've had that for three or three years for sure now. So mm-hmm. it's a good one, bulkier, but um, yeah, it's good. Yeah, I've used that a few times, and I'm glad you have it. <laughs> yeah, it's. I think it's covered many people. Yeah, it's so much faster than that MSR thing. Yeah, the MSR like it'll give you arm cramps with before you fill up two liters. Yours. You can fill four yeah. liters in like a third of the time. That MSR one is a piece of shit. I know a few people who've had that one and it's been nothing but issues. Yeah. So it's too hard to pump yeah. water through it, in my opinion. Yeah. Landon had one. Actually, he had two of them and both of them ended up with issues and he had to bring them back. So yeah. Stay away from that one. Catadine Hiker Pro, if you want something for multiple people. Yeah. B Gangs, you want to handle this question? So he was kind of just wondering what, what range of, uh, scope 
he was going to get. Yeah, and so he's looking at the new Zeiss. Zeiss Conquest. Yeah, V4. Uh, what magnification do you guys think is best for my type of hunting? I'm leaning towards 416 by 44, but the 312 by 56 and 624 by 50 both look like they've got their place as well. I hunt in Alberta and all different types of landscapes from prairies, mountains, and forests. I'll go on top of a Tika T3 Lite, 30 out 6, which is what you have too, right? Mm-hmm. Keep shots under 400 yards. Yeah. I don't, first of all, I think the scope he's looking at, or like the Zeiss, is, um, beats the shit out of our scopes. Yeah. <laughs> so I think he's looking at a pretty good scope there. And um, if he's keeping shots under 400 yards, I personally think a 312 would be fine. I think any of them would work, really. I mean, a 3.9 or a, I have a two, ten, 2 to 10 and the 3 to 12 are all pretty standard. And I think they'd work in every situation. Yeah. I don't know personally if I would bother going to the 414. I kind of like having that low end kind of two to three times magnification, mm-hmm. especially in BC. Yeah. So that's my thought on it. But um, I also don't quite know what the weight difference is between each of them. Right. But if that's a consideration, I don't know if I would go with the 414 if it if it does have some additional weight to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and price, I'm sure it gets pricier the more you go up that scale too. So yeah. if it was me, I'd probably just stick with the 312. There you go. Kel, um, Jesse Zeman sent me a link today that was pretty exciting. Yeah, And that's I awesome. sent it over to you and I thought it was fitting for you to take this one because you brought this issue to the table for us to go over earlier in the year. I don't know when we covered this, but yeah. Yeah, it was in the summer, I think. And um, kind of stumbled upon across this ongoing saga of the um, Douglas Lake Ranch uh, in the Merritt Central BC interior, South Central. And um, basically it's a big ranch that it's just enormous. The size of this thing is privately owned and it's owned by, I can't remember his name, but he owns like four or five sports teams in the States. Yeah. Like NBA, NFL, um, like huge uh, amount of money. I'm sure that this uh, owner has. Yeah. So it kind of seemed like a David and Goliath type story because he's arguing that these lakes, like Estonia and Mini Lake, I think they're called, given they were in the ranch, that they own those lakes. Right. And uh, there was even some reasoning that, you know, because how did it go? The land, the, they, they increased the water level of the lakes. So the land under those lakes was previously theirs so they were arguing like well actually we own the land under the lake exactly yeah they were doing all the all that type of of thing but and this has been going on forever and i think they were battling it was the Merritt fishing game club that really brought this to the table right and you can imagine that's the difference between resources between these two parties but um do you remember when this started i think it's been like 20 years or something if i remember correctly maybe even longer yeah i'd have to we'd have to double check but they did reach, reach a decision, um, and when we talked about it last, it was kind of with the court system. I think it'd been there for a couple of years. Well, I think it's been in and out of there quite a few times, isn't it? Yeah. And um, so it says, a decision has been rendered. BC Supreme Court judge in Kamloops ruled that catch and release public fishing will be allowed on both Minnie and Stony Lake. The ruling means that Douglas Lake uh, Cattle Company will need to take down the gates blocking access to both these lakes. Nicola Valley Fishing Game Club was suing the Douglas Lake Company, alleging the company blocked off public access to Minnie and Stoney. Yeah, because they were claiming the lakes to be their own, arguing they were man-made over many years. <laughs> um, so it says today's ruling has the potential to set a precedent for roughly 30 lakes in the area, as well as numerous others in BC. And I would say, like, that's huge because what would have happened if the other decision was reached yeah what does that mean for bc's lakes i think we said there's like three thousand lakes in bc Mm -hmm. so that's pretty scary to think that it could have went the other way yeah because um then people try to take advantage of that right yeah precedent is a powerful thing totally man so that's pretty awesome yeah yeah it's nice nice to hear stories like that (laughs) with everything else that's going on yeah we hit one of those fences when we're on the uh, mule deer for your dough. Yeah, not literally, but 
Well, we <laughs> we came up to one of them, <laughs> yeah. and we're and hoping, turned around. Yeah, we wanted to get into that area, and of course, that's where the gate was, and that's where we were like coming through all that mud too. <laughs> yeah, so we wanted to get out of there. But the most frustrating part about that was like they didn't put the gate by the creek, right where we started seeing all this kind of um, more of the wood fence. Like we could see, okay, something's coming up, yeah. and we might be getting into private land. But they didn't put the gate there. They wait till you drive over the creek and then up, way up into the mountain. And then they put the, the gate where you can't even turn around. So now you have to reverse all the way back. <laughs> yeah. like, it's a skinny little road. So it's kind of a shitty, just a cunty thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> for lack of a better word. Yeah. Rather than putting signs at the bridge that say, you know, gate ahead, private property. Yeah. They make you drive all the way up there and reverse all the way back <laughs> down. <laughs> Bastard. Yeah. Um, so I think that's awesome. Um, and we didn't have anything to do with it, but well, actually, I heard that the judge is actually a big fan of the show, so we kind of <laughs> swayed this decision yeah. there. I'm sure. Yeah, that's what I heard. Yeah, that's good, man. It's nice to hear that that kind of stuff. Turned your goddamn yeah, phone no off, shit. Kelly. Jesus. Every, the last four episodes <laughs> in a row, <laughs> and I'm holding it right beside the mic. <laughs> anything else you want to add to that one? No, not really. I'm just. It's surprising. I'm just, uh, it's cool to see an actual decision made for one. And then totally to have it go the right way is, is awesome. Yeah. And that's a good fishing lake too. So, or both of those. All yeah. Of them in there, but. Like I've never been up there and now I really want to go in there because that's some amazing land in there. Totally. It's yeah, very cool. When you see it from a distance and even when we're on that builder hunt, we're like, oh man, that's just like, that's the sort of the type of country that is like mule deer it's like yeah. what you picture your perfect meal there hunt to be because it's like rolling grass land type hills with little pockets of trees and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But but here's the thing. I still don't think we're going to be able to hunt. No, we can't. But it's nice to just be able to go in there and yeah. check it out. Yeah. And you'll be able to fish. But Yeah, it'd be nice if we were able to hunt. That's not going to happen. But just to be able to go in there and check it out. Yeah. That's the thing about a lot of the Okanagan is like there's that ideal picturesque mule deer habitat and most of it is farmland and you can't hunt on it so it's a bummer and it's generally in those lower elevation areas that yeah you want to get into and you often see a lot of deer in there but you can't go in so yeah that's a bummer but yeah so i guess we don't have to keep pushing that ad- that no. topic because we were um we did start reaching out to a few parties um to see what we could do about that one and yeah i'm pretty happy that yeah it's solved <laughs> definitely man I didn't tell you about this one. I'm curious what your your thoughts are on this topic. So the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, I think, is proposing a, a ban on commercial and uh, sport fishing on the southern end of Vancouver Island. So there's a, a population of about 74 southern resident killer whales that uh, feed on Chinook salmon. So they want to mm. shut down fishing in that area. And of course... You know, I think tourism and sport fishing lodges don't want to see that happen, right? So Mm -hmm. the idea is that um, they want to protect these remaining 74 resident killer whales. And there's a bit of a debate about, you know, is this even going to help if they shut down fishing in there? And of course, by shutting that down, it has a huge impact on people who make a living from sport fishing and tourism Mm -hmm. and and all that. So a lot of those companies have multiple locations too. Maybe right. it's just maybe it's just the bigger ones. Yeah. So here's the thing, man. It's it's really tricky because it's somebody's on one hand, it's someone's livelihood. And, you know, they have the right to <clears throat> to do that. They've been I'm sure they've been doing it for forever and I'm sure like generations in some cases, right? So do you shut it down to save these whales? Are they important enough? Well, this one's a little bit tougher probably for those folks because they're working to save something that they're not making the money on, right? Yeah. Like, so it, if it was salmon that were disappearing, I imagine I would hope they'd be, the bigger picture would be, well, we want to continue doing this for a hundred years. Yeah. So yeah, we'll give up one year for the hundred. Exactly. But this is kind of like, you know, we're doing it for a species that isn't related to our business. But yeah. I think, yeah, I don't know. That's a tough one. I think the only thing you can do is just get everybody to the table and have all the data and then make the best decision overall 
and not let one party sway it too much. Like the ultimate, there has to be one answer that's best for every, for the long-term goal. Yeah. They just got to figure out what the goal is. It's so hard, man. And it, 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 I'll explain both sides of this. It really bothers me when uh, money comes before conservation. It doesn't matter what we're talking about. Yeah. So if it's forestry. That's all short term. Exactly. So, you know, people need to make money. They need to, you know, they depend on uh, certain industries. If it's forestry, if it's uh, fishing or whatever, right? Uh, Everybody depends on these natural resources. But you're sacrificing potentially... I don't know what the science says because I haven't done enough research. There's a 50-50 chance you could be saying, fuck these whales, I don't care. I want to keep my you know, my lodge running. And if that means these whales disappear, then so be it. I have a, you know, I have to feed my family. On the other hand, it if these guys are allowed to to run these businesses, which they totally are, perhaps then there needs to be some sort of funding to help these guys, you know, financially so that we can go in a different direction. Um, you know what I mean? Cause I totally feel for these guys. It's like one year you're, you're, you're making a good living overnight. Someone says you can no longer fish here. That's brutal. Like that's mm-hmm. your whole, everything you've worked for. Right. And so what do you do from that point on? So I don't know what the answer is really other than like, giving these people financial assistance to try something different. But I don't think, you know, wiping out a population of killer whales is a good thing either. (laughs) Yeah. Once you do that, that's it. Like, yeah, I think I would think, yeah, I I just feel like it's another checkbox in the like wildlife management column. Like we need a independent type party that can, Take Look at all everything. the factors yeah, that w- come in without then, any bias. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, because with maybe not just with the killer whales, but salmon in general, and the the runs and the steelhead, I almost like it's getting to the point where why don't they just shut all fishing down for the year? Yeah, like all salmon, all steelhead, it's all shut down for a year. Yeah, I don't know if that would help. No, but maybe that's. Like I'm just saying in general, like some solutions that are that sound over the top. Maybe if you did that in a short term, it would get a, a little bump going. I don't know. I'm not a scientist, but I just feel like if you're a fisherman or a hunter that has a conservation mentality, then those are the types of things we'd be willing to do to save yeah, it for the long yeah, term. Exactly. Somebody reached out to me today and said they heard a rumor that they were going to shut down mule deer hunting in the Okanagan. I checked with another source and they said that's not going to happen. But the first thing that came to my mind was, hmm, yeah, okay, maybe that's maybe that's something that's needed and I'm okay with that. If somebody said mule deer are struggling in the Okanagan and, and we need to stop this for a couple of years, I'd say, yeah, okay. Yeah, I'd just go somewhere else. Yeah. Like do a different hunt. Yeah. And based on what I've it seen. It just has to be based on science. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, when I, when I got that message, I wasn't that surprised and – Part of me was like, "Wow, fuck, whatever, man. If that's if that's the case, then so be it. As long as there's, like you said, you know, science-backed information behind it, I'm more than happy to stop mm-hmm. hunting for a few years uh, for yeah. real deer around here to see him come back. Because these last two years have been, I don't know what the fuck's going on. But yeah, people get worried though because it starts getting into government, and they're like, "Oh, well, if they shut down for two years, then they'll shut down forever." Yeah, but that shouldn't actually be a concern. I know sometimes it is because there's not much trust, but it it shouldn't be a concern. Like there should, if there's a plan to shut them down for two years and then bring them back, then that's the mm-hmm. way it should. Like yeah, if that's, that's the case, then fine. Yeah. So. Um, but I, I kind of feel like the regs have gotten a little more liberal with mule deer around here. Um, just in terms of, I think before you had to go outside of a region to get the, the second mule deer, but uh, no, I think you still have to go outside. I don't know where I'm going with this, but some, something changed in this reg, and I thought it was a little more liberal, but... I can't remember. I can't remember. Yeah, I don't know. Actually, they did make a lot of things um, youth only. True. Which is not... That's actually less... They're trying to protect them for sure. Yeah. So I, yeah. So yeah, I don't know. Point being is uh, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with anything as long as I can uh, 
you know, look at the information and, and say, yeah, that makes sense. With this the whale thing kind of leads me to this next topic, which is pretty interesting, man, because um, a couple of weeks back, somebody sent us a question about, you know, asking us if we would hunt for seals, if that was an option. I think that was the question, something like that. And um, I talked about my time on the West Coast and how many seals we saw and sort of the amount of salmon that those guys are killing and the pressure that's putting on the the whales in, in some regions too. And they're actually starting to consider doing a, opening up a seal hunt mm. or at least a call. I think First Nations are going to be the first ones to, to be able to go in there. And they're actually doing a hunt on a small scale. And I think they're doing tests on the meat to see if mm. it can actually be consumed. But the more I read about it, the more it seems to make sense because seals, much like, you know, bears, there's so much you can do with them. Yeah. Right? You know what scares me the most about that is the negative publicity that's going to hit hunters when that stuff starts hitting the newspapers. And then it's going to spill over to all the other hunts that we do, like potentially. Yeah. Because it's going to be a public opinion nightmare, I feel like. Well, it's funny though, because it, it's, it's tied to killer whales though. Yeah. Which are pretty, they're a very picturesque uh, animal. Of course, there's going to be people that are against this, but again, it's like, the seals are out of control, man. I, I see if I can find the numbers while we're talking here, but it's something like they went from this is way off, but say it went from like you know 7,000 to 70,000 in a matter of like a, a few years, right? They're just totally exploding, <laughs> and uh, the west coast is overrun with these guys, so it's probably worth considering. And again, if if we have to kill some seals and consume the meat, use their hides uh, and everything else we can, then why not do it? If yeah. you can save the like, whales, you know, for people who don't hunt, I, I get mm-hmm. where they're coming from, but it's, um, I don't know, man, sometimes you have to kill a few things to save a few things. Sometimes yeah. it's the same species when you talk about like rhinos and that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. You take out those older males that get aggressive and kill the younger ones. You're, by, you know, you're doing them a favor by taking out the older ones. So, yeah, I think people nowadays just don't want to have any hard decisions or hard impacts. Yeah, man. But you can't, it's a, a bit of a life cycle. You can't have life without some of those things. Mm-hmm. And um, I totally agree. I think it should happen. I just get worried that, like, if, if the news presented it the way you just said, I yeah. think it would be fine because it's an education piece and it, how it's presented. But I feel like there's going to be people that totally ignore the killer whale side and just say, look at these hunters killing these wh- these yeah. seals. Yeah, exactly. But tell um, yeah, That's the kind of thing that scares me. Yeah, they're not really pitching it that way in this article that I'm looking at. So I found these stats here. So it says, according to one study, the harbor seal population in the Salish Sea is estimated at 80,000 today, up from 8,600 in 1975. Mm. So- that's just one region that they're talking about. Are they calling it a cull or a hunt? Well, they're not really calling it anything right now. So what they're doing is I think they're going to harvest. In early November, a group called the PBPS started using First Nations hunting rights as part of a plan to harvest 30 seals. The society plans to test the meat and blubber to see if it is fit for human consumption and other uses. So I guess they're in the early stages. I don't know what they're going to call it, if they're just going to open it up for First Nations or if it's going to be a call that's, you know, the government brings it to play and they do it or if they're actually going to open it up to to a seal hunt for residents. I have no idea. It doesn't really say, but interesting nonetheless, man. They're definitely Mm -hmm. out of control. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. All you have to do is go spend a few days on the ocean and you'll realize that they're... They're like vultures. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think we just need like a wildlife management type, you know, branch. Like a, it takes the same approach with every species, no matter what it is. Yeah. Or like where you can. And and they make these calls and they have the messages and the education to, to push the message the right way. And mm-hmm. um, I know it kind of rolls into Jesse's whole pitch too about, how we can manage this in the future with the right resources and yeah. um, legislation and targets. Totally. 
I wish we had that because I think some of these things would be much easier if we did. Yeah, man. Because I think it's in the presentation too, even though we know it's the right thing to do. Yeah. Got to present it the right way. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny, man. When you look at this stuff, you get a few steps in the right direction, a few in the wrong direction, but hopefully we get a few more in the right direction and and uh, we can pull ourselves out of this mm-hmm. nosedive that we seem to be in. Yeah. So anyways. Yeah. That's all I had for today. Anything else you want to add? It's another uh, bummer ending. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we always seem to end on the sad note. <laughs> Actually, it wasn't all bad news. No, I mean, it was mostly positive. Mostly it was positive. just that last little, uh, I mean, even that story is actually a good one, right? Like, yeah, it's people bringing up a concern. And I think that is a way to deal with it because the other way to deal with it is sometimes they end up wasting all the meat. Right. Like if it isn't hunters or First Nations that are taking the meat, then who is it and what are they doing with it? Yeah, and exactly. is it wasteful? Yeah, yeah. So I think it's a good story too. I just put a little bit of a twist on there because I am worried that it could potentially backfire for all hunters, for even like deer and everything. Like it just yeah. puts that magnifying glass on you, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but it, that might not happen. It's just one one thing I'm a little yeah, cautious for sure, man. about. No, it's it's yeah, it's just a bummer that something like that could be turned into a negative. One, you're helping out killer whales. Two, seals are potentially a very useful animal if, mm-hmm. as far as a, a resource and also a food source. So. Yeah, I, I don't see anything wrong with it, man. Yeah, other than it's a loss of life, and I know that's hard for people to swallow, but um, I think it's worth considering. Yeah, it's a loss of life at somebody's hands, whereas I think people are okay with loss of life if it doesn't involve a person. You're right. Like if the if the whales died because they all starved to death, people would be like, ah, you know, that's just the way it is, or maybe they, they'd be upset, but they wouldn't be as upset as like photos of hunters with seals yeah because they just can't connect the two no it's frustrating yep especially when seals are they kind of look like dogs it makes it a little harder <laughs> yeah but, they're uh, cute animals that's the thing yeah but yeah, yeah given the opportunity i would do it for sure yeah cool man seal seal soup seal soup yeah <laughs> i wonder what that blubber's like you can make yourself a nice seal vest too <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's true some gloves <laughs> yeah anyways before we, we go too far deep in the weeds here let's <laughs> wrap this thing up okay well uh i guess chat soon yeah cheers cheers this episode of rookie hunter was also brought to you by north arm knives north arm knives are handcrafted and sold directly through a father and son team right here in british columbia Choose from a selection of outdoor knives, kitchen knives, and custom engravings from northarmknives.com. They ship internationally and guarantee all of their work. Kelly and I have put their products to the ultimate test and give them our stamp of approval. Head over to northarmknives.com.